Hello and welcome back to Moffett Field. Today I'm going to do a video on Historical Board Gaming's new game, The Battle of Midway. We've played about five games of it or so. Really fun. But I know one of the questions out there is, and we'll just address it right off the bat, is it worth uh, around $200? And I guess the answer to that is, it depends. And I would say it depends on your interest in the Pacific Theater naval battles. Midway in particular, it depends on, I guess, your budget. It depends on if you have sculpts available already that you could use in the game and chips. But I went ahead and got the Admiral's package, which pretty much has everything. So let me go through what that entails for the Admiral's package. There's also the Captain's package. One has to supply the sculpts. And then there's the Lieutenant's package where one supplies the, the, the sculpts, the playing pieces, the markers, the chips, and the dice. I imagine a lot of people out there could probably get by with the captain's package or the lieutenant's package. But let's go through what this contains. This is the admiral's package. Right off the bat, it contains the, the map, which is 21 and a half by 32. Vinyl, it rolls up, it lays pretty flat. You might have to put some things on it to keep it flat for a while. It includes a rule book, which is pretty nicely done. I'll show you that later. It includes these two unit charts that have the different types of units and what they attack and defend at and move at, etc. Pretty standard stuff. Double-sided, has boats, pretty much the ships on one side and the planes on the other. There are two of these boards here that have the different uh, carriers. So three carriers for the Americans and five for the Japanese. One puts the sculpts on here and keeps track of uh, the launch and recover of the aircraft. There's two setup sheets, two battle boards, one US and one Japanese, and it has these rings that you set up on and then uh, work your way in. So it's kind of like flying in and getting to the center where the carrier is. There are three division fleet markers here that you put your sculpts on and move around the board. For this is the Japanese side, four task force markers. The Americans have three task force markers, one for each carrier. There's these uh, roundels that are used to pull out of a cup to determine whose turn it is. There's a battle token that gets pulled, a battle chit, and then a weather squall marker, a uh, chit that gets pulled, and then you put a squall marker on the board. On the Japanese sculpt side, there are five carriers, four of the battleships, four tone heavy cruisers, and I saw in the Board Game Geek description today questions that they only built two of those, but the other two are to represent other terms of search because these four carriers, in, in essence, carry the four search planes, the Jake Patrol aircraft that are over here, that can be purchased, I believe, without the stand as well. Then there are the heavy cruisers. There's six of those. I got seven of them. There are 16 of the destroyers. I got 18 of those. My package was missing the light cruisers, so I think someone got confused here, but uh, Doug at Historical Board Gaming said he will send those out and um, make it some other, couple other replacements as well. There are 16 fighters, or sorry, yeah, 16 uh, fighters. I got 17 of those. There's 12 Kate attack bombers. For some reason, I ended up with 16. There are 12 VAL dive bombers. Then there's these chips here that one uses to mark the airplanes. And I believe there are 11 or 12 of those. There are 12, 11 orange, 11 brown, five purple. There's these tokens here for marking the status of the carriers. So they are they in launch or recover mode, which is important in the game. Of, if the carrier has to land planes, then one puts it in recover. If you want to launch strikes, then uh, the launch mode. There's victory tokens. Then in the shared area here that everyone uses, there are 20 bomb tokens, 20 torpedo tokens. I got 21. There's eight of these recon markers to make bombers uh, reconnaissance aircraft. There's uh, 10 each of these fuel tokens. There are 10 squall tokens, 20 bomb markers. 12 hidden task force carrier markers, 12 dice. Convoy markers go on the Japanese side, 
that marks the convoys on the way to Midway. There's a victory token, so this is the US side now. So there's a victory token. There's three markers for the carriers. There are 13 blue chips, 13 black chips, and 13 green chips. I only had a 12 black chips. I don't know why it wasn't that big a deal though. There should be a seaplane marker, an airfield marker, and a AAA marker, or AA anti-aircraft gun marker. I got three seaplane markers. There's three US carriers. The heavy cruisers, there are eight of those. There's 12 destroyers. Then in terms of the Catalina aircraft, there's four of those that they fly out of Midway. So they don't have a ship like the Japanese do that are associated with those search aircraft. There's two B-17s. There's a B-26 and a B-25. The B-25 is kind of an extra. The B-26 is the one that's used in the game. There are... 12 dive bombers, dauntless dive bombers, eight devastator torpedo bombers, and 12 wildcat fighters, and then a hundred of these white chips that are used for the midway aircraft and a few other things in the game. There's a hundred. There's no way that one needs a hundred of them. I'm, I'm not sure why they gave so many of those. And I think that covers what comes with the Admiral version. Based on that, Maybe that helps make a decision if it's worth 200. I would say if, if one tried to put this game together, it would at least cost $200. This map, if I were to take that to Alpha Graphics and Sunnyvale, they would charge me 60 to $80 to print this. These, probably another 10 or 20 bucks to print each one of these things. You know, a couple of bucks for these for these sheets, but the a rule booklet is easily 10, 20 bucks. Yeah, I think there's probably $200 worth of stuff here if one pieced it out and bought it individually, some of it you wouldn't be able to buy. You couldn't find these task markers, but if you had a laser cutter, I guess you could cut that. That sums up the contents of the Admiral's package. And now we'll, I'll set it up and show what it looks like in gameplay. This is the setup as the game starts, and I'll go through the Japanese setup, the American setup, a little bit around the victory points, how the game is won, the reinforcement uh, reinforcements that are available, and then some tips and tricks that we kind of learned along the way. So to start off with, the Japanese start with this force in the space 37. This is where all the reinforcements will come in. So they start with four cruisers, two destroyers, and everything's hidden at the beginning of the game. There's the Akagi and Kaga in space 12 with uh, Cap flying with one fuel left. There's the Soryu and Hiryu with Cap as well, and there's an American Catalina there, but the ships remain hidden until the Catalina discovers them. A battleship and destroyer up in C-Zone 1. They the Japanese also start with a Kate search aircraft in 2 and 14. And then the main strike force that's on its way to Midway or possibly to American ships if they're found. Sees on 21, 8 fighters, 6 dive bombers, and 6 attack bombers. The Japanese attack bombers can also carry torpedoes, but in this case they're loaded with bombs to bomb Midway. For reinforcements, the Japanese have the Zuho, which comes in as the first reinforcement, a battleship, cruiser, light cruiser, and destroyer as second reinforcements. And then thirdly, two cruisers, which carry patrol aircraft. Those are the tone cruisers and two other heavy cruisers. So four cruisers on the third. It's nice to have this come on as quickly as possible, but unfortunately it's the third because those two extra search aircraft do make a difference. In terms of what's loaded on the decks or loaded on the carriers, there's two fighters, three attack bombers. The Soryu and Hiryu have dive bombers instead waiting on de uh, waiting in the hangar. And then the Zuho gets four aircraft when it comes on, on a, as a reinforcement with attack bombers loaded with torpedoes. The Japanese also have these convoys to invade Midway. These are the sculpts I have remaining in case the task force split. One can use these extra sculpts. Now let's look at the Americans. The Americans start midway with two fighters on cap, a Catalina ready to launch, one B-26, a torpedo bomber, and five dive bombers. Also on the map, they have a Catalina in, 20, in 36, in 11, and in four. Ready for reinforcements are the Enterprise, the Yorktown, and the Hornet. Each of those come with four fighters, two torpedo bombers that only carry torpedoes, and six dive bombers. So they're all the same in terms of what they carry. And then here's Midway on the bottom of the player card. 
with six anti-aircraft guns. To win the game, each side has to be the first to get to 12 victory points. For the Japanese, that's typically accomplished by landing these convoys on Midway or getting them into the same space as Midway. If four or more from a group of eight land on the island, that's two victory points. So they have to travel basically from space 37, accompanied by a task force or other ships. They have to travel across usually the bottom of the map because that's the fastest route to Midway without being sunk. The Japanese also get victory points for taking out the airbase on Midway. That's worth five points. American carriers are worth three victory points and cruisers are worth one victory point. It's possible to achieve victory in different combinations, but typically it involves Midway. It, it's possible, I guess, to sink most of the American fleet and win that way as well. There's no victory points for destroyers or airplanes. The Americans, the only way for them to win is to sink carriers, battleships, and cruisers. I'd say it's more challenging based on our experience for the Americans to win just due to the overwhelming quantity of Japanese ships. Typically, by the time the game ends, most sides, both sides are out of airplanes because they typically get shot down. It can end up being a sea battle at the end which can be interesting as well. However, it does tend to drag on once all the ships are sunk because every time a, a carrier is sunk or midway is taken out, one of these turn marker, or what are these called? I forget what these are called, but they, you put these in a cup and you draw them out. And then if, you're, if your token gets drawn, then you get to move your ships or take other actions, move your planes, attack, launch, things like that. As the carriers get sunk, you get down to like one or two of these per side. Plus, and usually this uh, squall token is out by the end of the game because most of the squall has been put on the map already. So every time one of these is drawn, a squall marker is placed up in the top two rows of the map. And those have different impact. If you go into a squall, there's no combat. Search aircraft can only search with one die. The planes, if they fly into a squall, they have to stop. So this has varying effect. It can be positive or negative. It can be great to escape into a squall, or it can be frustrating if you want to launch planes, but the squall comes your way. At the end of the game, there could be only four four of these and the, and the battle token. Once the battle token's drawn, then you go through a whole turn phase. It can be a little frustrating or, or tedious at the end because this comes up much more frequently than at the beginning of the game when there's 10 or so tokens so there's a 1 in 10 chance, but at the end, it gets decreased. There could be a 1 in 3, a 1 in 2, a 1 in 4 chance that the battle token gets drawn. And then you have to go through the whole process of resetting the carriers, etc., etc. If victory doesn't happen relatively quickly, the game can drag on. We're trying to think of, is there a way to, to have fewer of these drawn at the end? But we haven't come up with a solution for that. I think that's about it. Uh, some of the little tricks we've come up with are to put these stickers I ordered these stickers for like two or three bucks off of Amazon just to help color code things. So purple corresponds with the purple, the purple chips. On the search cruisers, we put these markers to help remember which cruisers have search capability or search planes. They're pretty unique sculpts, but they all start to look the same. It's hard sometimes to keep track of which type of cruiser is which type of cruiser. Same thing here. Put these stickers on. Same thing on the American side. Mark the fleet markers with these little dots to help keep track. So there's a few little tricks. Her tweezers does come in handy. There's a lot of little tokens to move and things are always falling off these chips and you have to manage the chips and the tokens. So the logistics of the game are can be a little tedious with all the chips and the tokens and the torpedoes and the, and the damage markers. Quite a bit of time is spent stacking things and um, I'm working on a solution for that. I think I've got something that I'll show in a future video. One could print stickers, perhaps even do away with the sculpts altogether. I know that's a bit of heresy, but one could print stickers and just put them directly on the chips. And you could put torpedoes on one side of the chip and bomb marker on the other side. So there could be ways to streamline the game a bit, not have all these pieces falling over and having to manage them all the time. Again, I'll show you in a future video what I've done personally to, I think, well, we'll see, I haven't tried it yet, but you know, streamline the game and get it playing faster. We found the first game to be about eight hours because we had a lot of reading to do. Probably gotten it down to four or five hours. I think the game says two to three. I think that's optimistic given the complexity of the game and all the management that one has to make. Here's a quick look 
at the rule book. It's printed on nice material, great graphics. Uh, front cover, Mike Kelly is the designer. Full disclosure, Mike lives in the Bay Area here and I've met him a few times and we talked quite a bit on WhatsApp and he entertained a lot of the questions we had while we went through our first few games and ran into scenarios that weren't covered in the rule book and no rule book is ever gonna carry or cover all scenarios that come up and all questions. I would say a playbook could benefit this game quite a bit if it covered more of the gameplay and how to set up the battle boards and things like that. No rule book can, can cover every scenario, but that would help. And Mike was kind enough to put a lot of the FAQs up on Board Game Geek and answer a lot of the questions we had as we went through the game. So obviously it covers all the components that come with the game how to set up the game, the individual sheets cover where you actually put the pieces. Again, the graphics are nice. This is probably my the best historical board gaming rule book I've seen. It's just uh, well produced, it's well edited. There's very little actual errata in the game, misspellings or anything like that. The game is pretty clear. Uh, the order of phase is pretty interesting. This, we refer to this every turn because we could not keep it straight. It's not that intuitive in certain ways. If you do play through it, you'll find that the land aircraft in, in turn one is kind of counterintuitive. You almost feel like it should be down here in phase five. So there's the section here where one chooses the carrier status. That's the launch, maneuver, or recover aircraft that are trying to land. There's spot aircraft on deck, and then there's land aircraft. Then it goes into the conduct search operations, which is pretty interesting. You move your search aircraft around trying to find the, the fleets. We actually play the game blind, so we don't keep the task force markers on the board. We track them separately on a piece of paper. That probably added some additional confusion and, and complexity to the game. We had to modify the search rules a little bit, but it was pretty great uh, playing it totally blind because you don't know where the fleets are. It probably gives the Japanese more of an advantage than they would if you put the task forces on the board. More challenging for the Americans, for sure. Then there's the execute. I think I covered that. Then there's invade islands, perform cap, and then resolve the attacks on the battle boards, and then return the units to base, burn fuel, rearm bombers, clear the decks, and then end the turn. That's the order of play per turn. The graphics are, are well done. The examples are pretty good that are in the book. Shows how, how the battle board is set up. Um, this is the section that has the battle boards and how they get set up. It's 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 unique. There, I don't think there's a game that has a battle board set up like this. Uh, it took a lot of thought actually to come up with this because you, you come in from the outside as you would probably if you're trying to attack the carriers that are protected at the center of the task force or carrier division. The cap, set so up the cap fighters here on the outer ring. And then there's the destroyers that are out here, then you have to fly through the cruisers, and then you get to the aircraft, the carriers, and the battleships. Pretty unique, and, and it's one thing we changed also is we played this blind, the setup blind, so we didn't know how each other was setting up the boards. You're supposed to roll dice for these, some of these components to place them on the board, but we played it with setting them up ourselves without the other player knowing. So a very interesting concept here in the battle board, but their scenarios where if you have planes and boats, but planes still in the space that are flying back to the ships, do they defend, do they attack? So there's scenarios and situations that aren't covered in the rules that really need more clarification. There's about three or four scenarios where you're just not really sure how to set up the board. But the scenarios that are given here are, are well done, well written, and then it has just the some optional rules in the back, but a good, good rule book. Again, well written. Very clear. Gameplay itself is fun. It takes a lot of thought and one could probably analyze the situation forever like most games, but it comes down to a lot of times just gut instinct. Things like, should you launch your planes? Should you go after Midway twice if you're the IGN forces? Should torpedoes be loaded in case the Americans are discovered? How much searching to do? Where to search? There are decisions like what should one use these tokens when they're pulled to launch a strike or is it better to wait for perhaps planes that are out of fuel and out of armament to land get them ready and then relaunch or is it better to move the destroyers and the battleships closer 
Is it better to bring in reinforcements? There's a lot of decisions to make and often they're not ideal. I tend to launch strikes with one or two planes. That's another thing too that one has to consider is that how many planes are gonna get shot down? Seldom do many of the planes make it through the cap, through the anti-aircraft. You might send six bombers in and two get through and one hit, which is kind of in a way what actually happened at Midway. They'd end up with two bombers going in and getting one hit, which was enough to take out the carrier. The carriers actually take four hits. The battleships take three or four hits. Cruisers take one hit. It takes a few runs at a carrier to knock it out of commission. There are surface battles that can occur, as I mentioned. Those are unique too in how they work on the battle board. So there's a lot of choices to make in this game. In watching a lot of the videos of Midway and reading some articles, the game seems to represent what actually happened at Midway in, in kind of some interesting ways. There may tend to be some sea battles that didn't happen at Midway, but at least at the beginning of the game, one has to make these crucial decisions with limited resources and with limited information if playing blind, because one doesn't even know where the Japanese fleets are. There's a lot of interesting and dynamic gameplay in the game. There should be a lot of replayability in this game because the weather will change the game. One can do different strategy or tactics and go after the fleets. You can go after midway. There's house ruling you could do with the hidden movement, adding submarines. Um, so there's, there's room to expand the game. This game definitely isn't Axis and Allies. It may look like it, but uh, totally different gameplay. I would say some things to improve on the game, again, are the logistics of the game. Maybe some, like as, as I mentioned, stickers for these chips, or somehow get rid of these chips because they just, I'm always fumbling around with the chips and trying to keep them straight and flipping these tokens over or, or taking them off, or every turn you have to change the fuel markers as fuel's consumed. And sometimes it's hard to keep track of, did the plane come out of fuel this turn or last turn? Should it return to base now or later? Sometimes on the cards, it's difficult to remember if the plane landed, you know, which turn did it land in? Should it go to the deck? Should it refuel? There can, there can be different planes mixed with some that are armed and some that are pending to be armed. Fumbling around of the pieces occasionally that, that, get, that gets frustrating. And I think there's ways to, to improve that. If you're a painter, if you like to paint, these pieces definitely need some painting. They're nice, they're nice sculpts, but it's, it's sometimes it's a little difficult to tell the difference between the different types of bombers, between the valves and the dive bombers. So that's the valve. So when they're, you know, when you're on the board and you've got all these pieces laid out, it can be a little difficult. So even if you get a little paint on the wingtips to help differentiate those uh, different planes, the American planes, the fighters, of course, are easy to see because they're so much smaller. The American planes, I guess, similar situation. It'd be nice if to you know paint these or have stickers or something to differentiate them because these are the planes do tell you what the stack of chips are. And I know that we've messed things up. I know I've messed things up and mixed up chips. And sometimes I'm like, wait, I have five chips for fighters but I know that the, they only start with four. So sometimes these chips get mixed up. Again, a sticker on here identifying this stack is torpedo bombers, this stack is fires, would help prevent some of that confusion. But overall, it's fun to play with the sculpts. It's, um, they work well, everything works pretty well. There's not a whole lot of improvements to be done other than the streamlining of it because it does take time to, to manage all the chips and everything. And I would rather be thinking about the strategy than stacking up chips. So there's a lot of good here. Again, is it worth $200? That's up to you, depending on your interest in the game. And if you need, again, sculpts, if you need pieces, there's a lot here. I do wish the game came with 21 destroyers because that's what the starting number calls for. It only comes with 16. Minor, that's pretty minor. People use the white chips for the destroyers. It's for the extra destroyers. So, you know, not a biggie there, I guess, but uh, I was going through the list. And I was thinking like, huh, why, why doesn't, why don't I have 21 destroyers? So a small thing, but I would rather have fewer white chips and five more destroyers. 200 bucks for the admiral's version and down to $60 for the lieutenant version of the game. 
I would say, again, if you're interested in Midway in Pacific Theater, we've had a lot of fun with the game and glad I've purchased it and I actually bought a second copy to play remotely with my brother who just moved back to New Mexico. So we're going to be trying games remotely with his board setup and uh, my board setup here. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video.